Asman Degora from Oxfam. Um, I'm not asking this from my Oxfam point of view. This is purely personal interest. Um, this is directed at Sean uh, in particular. The almost rebalancing of the rights of states um, versus international investors. Now, what I'm fascinated by is the fact that South Africa is pushing this issue very hard. But in your view, and from the point of view of anyone who's um, involved in the South African government's thinking, does this stance reflect South Africa's status as an outbound investor into other countries in Africa? Are we not, in a way, shooting ourselves in the foot? And also because if you think about the background of a lot of bilateral investment treaties, the thought behind it was that it insulates investors against countries with potentially weak in national institutions. And uh, at the, ex I mean, at the uh, risk of offending people, <laughs> a lot of countries we're investing in to meet that sort of criteria. What are your thoughts on that? And what's anyone else's thoughts about the South African government stance in light of this? Thank you. Yes, thank you. My name is Malcolm McKinnon, and uh, I've been the uh, a, a traded, senior trade advisor to uh, SADC on trading services since last August. So my comment is r really a comment rather than a question, but I was talking um, to the speaker bef uh, during the interval. Um, because uh, I also wanted to pick up the points that Trudy made when uh, she made her opening remarks about new thinking for uh, the, the trading services negotiations. Um, we have a, a problem with, within the SADC uh, trading services protocol context in that it was been built um, pretty much on the WTO GATS agreement almost in its entirety. So the structure that the member states uh, decided limits really the uh, extent to which uh, new thinking can be introduced uh, into the commitments that would be taken in schedules under the protocol. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking about these new uh, approaches. And in fact, I think we've been doing this for quite some time, al although there's been quite a degree of reluctance amongst the member states to engage it very far. And this may come back to some of the points that Paul was making. Um, and the professor were, were making about the reluctance of member states to seriously engage, particularly in this trade in services area. Because the key point is not so much about making commitments um, under the protocol, because that's largely a technical exercise, or could be seen as a technical exercise. Um, and it's not in, in any event an end in itself but it's a mechanism to get to where the member states want to get to in terms of regional integration of services. So the point about having to incorporate um, the negotiations within the framework of the other protocols that exist and the integration that is provided there is absolutely fundamental. So when you talk to member states about their vision for the future of the services sector in their countries, in 10 to 15 years' time, and you think, well, where do you want to be and what's stopping you? All those classic uh, questions that you ask um, of these, uh, uh, th at this point of vision, you find um, that really the member states haven't thought too much at all about regulatory reform. Um, now, I know we, I, I take advice from what was said about not making too many comparisons with Europe, but many developed countries uh, started with the regulatory reform, such as the uh, European um, modernization of its telecoms framework in the 90s, which then led to the EU's GATS, nego uh, GATS commitments, but the framework can, uh, came first. Similarly in the postal sector, similarly in financial services, and other developed countries have done that. So there's no reason, in fact, there's every reason why SADC should, a SADC member state should engage in this process in the same way. So. We have to work with these other protocols, and this is what we're trying to do. About uh, 18 months ago, I think it was, before I came to join um, as an advisor, we had a study which was, uh, which was done to compare the trading services protocol with the other protocols. This has been, uh, this is published, it's out there. Um, the challenge is still to make it um, uh, a reality in terms of meaningful commitments within these uh, negotiations. Uh, take uh, the transport communications and metrology protocol where there are lots of um, objectives about harmonization of standards for transport. And yet when we talk um, to the member states about commitments in the trade in services uh, protocol, these um, objectives of, of um, 
doing something about axle weights and road user charges and so on do not exist in the debate. And I think it's a real travesty because we ought to be using these negotiations to um, address these fundamental issues like transport costs or other costs in other sectors, energy supply and so on. And this is what I've been trying to work with the Secretariat to try and achieve, but we have to do it with the member states because it's member state driven and that is a very big challenge. We've only got a year to go before we conclude. Let's see what we can do. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Brendan Vickers. I'm with the Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa. Um, I just wanted to perhaps respond to Paul's question around the need for um, rethinking the model of regional integration underpinning our, um, our approach in Southern Africa. And I think that is the big question. And uh, I think in that regard, Professor Mukunda, Weir's presentation and yours come together quite nicely because uh, from South Africa's perspective, uh, I think we have put forward a framework which is quite useful for all of us to think about how we conceptualize and advance regional integration. And that's very much what we call developmental regionalism or developmental integration. Uh, and essentially it consists of three pillars, um, which I think is very applicable to the challenges we face in the region. Uh, the three pillars are market integration. The second is uh, infrastructure development. And the third is policy coordination with a strong focus on uh, developing industrial capacity and regional value chains. So I think in terms of this approach, you know, when we talk about market integration, we deal with all the traditional but also some of the non-traditional issues beyond the border, um, and particularly around the uh, integration of goods and services. When it comes to infrastructure, really connecting uh, markets, particularly for goods and services, there we have the transport corridors, but also things like the spatial development initiatives and the north-south corridor. And then very importantly, the third is this issue of policy coordination, uh, where we have a very strong emphasis on trying to promote regional value chains and developing supplier linkages to support our respective industrial capacities. Um, I think the challenge, though, is that much of this has to be preceded and also turn on strong political cooperation and political coordination among the member states. Um, but we are happy that to a large degree this, this framework that I would encourage us all to think about, uh, market integration, infrastructure development and policy coordination is to a large degree now being um, driven through the Southern African Customs Union, SADC, if one looks at the tripartite free trade area, there are negotiations concurrently on all three pillars happening. And we would also like to see this approach embedded in the continental free trade area when the negotiations um, begin. Um, and I think ultimately the, be the, the benefit of this approach is really to see that um, you know, all member states actually do benefit from, the, uh, from, from regional integration taking place. So I thought I would just put forward our policy perspective, which I think is a useful framework for all of us to think about. Thank you. My name is Kelvin Kamaya. I come from Zambia, from the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry. But I'll ask these questions or some of, I'll make some observations in my own personal capacity. My observation and question refers to the first presentation. I think in your presentation, my observation is that the SADC Treaty of uh, 1992, for me, I look at it as being uh, extra ambitious. But in your presentation, when you look at the indicators in terms of the regional economic integration, you raised an issue that some of the targets or the indicators were highly ambitious. But when you look at the time frame from 1992 to date, about over 20 years, and in your presentation, you raised an issue that there are still some other countries that are still even fighting for the accession. And the aspect of a customs union not, uh, not attained. I think for me, this raises a concern that what was fought with the RISDP. And already I've made an observation that it's so, so wide and the priorities probably are too, are too ambitious. I think for an ambitious street, you also require an ambitious plan. And I think these are some of the issues we should, we should be looking at. What went wrong? What are the lessons that we can take from the, implement, the previous implementation of RISTD, STB? Then also, I wanted to ask you to shed more light, because when you look at the number of countries that are members of SADC, about close to 40%, also belong to the SACU. And SACU is one of the oldest uh, customs union that we have. So what lessons, what values uh, in terms of what can we appreciate 
that can help transform the regional economic integration through the, the, the SADIC. What lessons have we gotten from, from that? Has it brought any value or it's not important? So probably if you could shed more light. And also on the aspect of the financing, how is the mechanism of financing the RISTDP? Then the second question or observation is on the last presentation that addressed the issue of NTB. Uh, yeah, broadly, you raised the, the challenges and uh, causes that lead to these NTBs. But I would have appreciated if you brought in, because these are realities on, on the ground and member states are experiencing these challenges and they are constraining or they are playing as a disincentive for them even to undertake certain commitments, either at FTA or at Customs Union. So I, I would have appreciated if you came up with a case study on the practical uh, NTB and how it's impacting and how it can be uh, uh, dealt. Because I can give one case example for Zambia. Uh, Zambia and South Africa, we have been having a trade dispute in the honey uh, exports, honey coming from Zambia to, to South Africa. We have a challenge. South Africa is saying, uh, creating an in-country measure to restrict honey from Zambia by saying uh, Zambian honey, it's uh, contaminated or it has, it's not disease-free, it has American fibroid. And yet several studies have been done and it has confirmed that such a disease does not exist. So one wonders where such a thing is, is coming from. Is it an NTB or is it really it has to take for the South Africans to, to say yes in Zambia, there's no, no such disease. But of course, we, we are told that you can still export honey from Zambia, but in, in raw form, in bulk honey, in the sense that when you export it to South Africa, it has to be irradiated. And in Zambia, we do not have irradiation machines. It's only in South Africa. So our farmers or our processors are expected to export a bulk honey, which fetches a lower uh, amount uh, than the table honey or finished honey. So these are some of the critical issues that I wanted you to bring out, a case study and how you can handle that. Thank you. Thanks, Gus, for the question. Um, I think it's a very nice question to answer. I do think, however, that there might be some people sitting in the audience who may be able to give you a slightly more informed answer than, than I can, but I can certainly speculate, and I'm, I'm about to. So. Um, if you let me caricature South Africa's position in international investment, um, this is obviously not an accurate picture, but it, to simplify things. We're a country that receives a lot of investment from Europe, and we're a country that invests outward into Africa. Now, obviously, the picture is more complex than that, but if, if we use that as a basis. Fine, so we are gonna cancel our bilateral investment treaties and we're gonna replace them with a piece of domestic legislation that governs incoming investment. As you rightly point out, what does that mean for outgoing investment? It doesn't, it, it doesn't provide any framework for that. Now, I haven't seen any communications from the government as to the fact that it's considered this. I'd like to believe that it has, and I, I assume it has. So. What, what is the possibility? What, where, where do you think we can go for, with this? Now, one possibility, and it's kind of supported by the evidence so far, is that South Africa is not planning on cancelling all its bilateral investment treaties, but simply those with countries from whom it is a net recipient of foreign investment. Uh, of the, I think, around 19 bilateral investment treaties that South Africa had in force at the beginning of 2012, about 13 of those were with European countries, and the rest were split between three or four African countries and China, Cuba, and one or two others. Um, interestingly, of the five or six that it has begun to terminate, they're all with European countries. No indication of what's going to happen to those treaties with African countries and with countries from the rest of the world. So perhaps there will be this dual system bilateral investment treaties with countries with where we would like to invest in and no bilateral investment treaties with countries that would like to invest in us. Another possibility is that, and this is perhaps was not really touched on in my, in my presentation, but kind of implicit there, was that perhaps a regional approach will replace the bilateral investment treaties, certainly within a southern African and perhaps 
pan-African context later down the line. So in, in which case we might see all bilateral investment treaties getting um, cancelled and a regional approach which perhaps isn't as open to the non-region as the, the SADX FIPS investment annex is, but is, is purely a regional investment agreement. So those are two possibilities for what may happen which would kind of provide some framework for um, outward investment from South Africa. But again, that's just speculation on my part. There are two issues I think we need to get very clear from how we have to approach the review. And it, it, actually, it's my own personal opinion. It's not SADAC secretariat or anything. Uh, the SADAC treaty, and I started with it, it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's ambitious. The SADAC Treaty is, is expo expounding the objectives, what the region, how they want an integrated regional community from an economic integration point of view is that let's have free movement of these factors of goods, services, capital, investment, labor, etc. So it, that is not an ambitious, it is an objective. Now the RISDP came in and the, in fact, the, the SADAC Treaty said develop policy to, uh, policies to achieve that. So the RISDP was a response then, it's almost like a, a policy framework, an approach of integration that will lead to that. Therefore, their approach, they look at the European Union experience of a kind of a linear progression graduating from FTA going into customs union, going into common market, going to monetary union. So they, there was an approach. And that approach was given timelines and that 2008 FTA, et cetera, et cetera. The, the debate is about ambitious and over optimistic. It's more about those, the target to reach that. That must be very clear. Secondly, the debate that is also happening that probably also led to a customs union not being achieved is a debate that has not necessarily matured, but that is saying, and I, 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 I'm probably leading, reading that in, in, through these uh, uh, remarks as well, that's saying, you do not necessarily need to be a monetary union to embrace a framework that leads to the, free, the flow of investment or the flow of capital within the region. It's not necessarily the European approach may not be the, the, the only way that is suitable to the region. So that is almost the debate as well. It's about the targets that are unrealistic, but it's also about are we really able to do this? And that debate has even been uh, uh, sort masked by what is happening in Europe and what has been happening in Europe lately regarding the euro crisis, etc. So there are two issues, the targets and whether the approach is the right approach to achieve the objective of the treaty. But if you want and in integrated economic space, you need to reduce obstacles to the free flow of those economic uh, 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 um, activities of services, of goods, of capital, investment, etc. So there's nothing with the, wrong with the treaty as such, but is this the right approach? Is there another approach? Can we think out of the box and see beyond Europe whether we can achieve the, the, what the objectives of, of the treaty is uh, aiming at. The question of SACU, I could not get it right, but I think you wanted to, to, to whether we have learned something from SACU, isn't it? Lessons from SACU. I think they, we have learned a lot uh, from SACU. First of all, probably it's, it's really the revenue issue. We have learned about it, and it, it's an issue that 
currently is quite a very serious issue in, in SACU that may determine the future of SACU the way we know it. And secondly, is that SACU, the BNS have not given up the area sovereignty on national trade and industrial policy knowingly, consciously. They found themselves having already absorbed into the South African trade and industrial policy kind of configuration. So it was not a negotiation, really, of them giving up sovereignty. And we are realizing that the debate around SAC, I mean, SADAC Customs Union, those issues were coming out quite clearly. This divergence of, no, 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 no. We, may, we cannot have a, a common in that, uh, trade policy. Having a common external tariff will be difficult. What about customs revenue? Those issues came out. So some member states were quite sensitive around those issues, uh, learning from even some SACU member states, they probably thought, oh, now we are going to have a, to be a SADA customs union. What about our revenue? We depend on 60% of our national budget on the SACU revenue. So there are many lessons we can learn, but I think fundamentally we must not assume that SACU would have been a SACU if it did not evolve within the South African political configuration. I think that is an important issue. The other issue is the financing of the RISDP. Um, yes, it is a challenge, and I, I have uh, explained how there was a reprioritization. Today it's a challenge, and I think we all know that the SADC member states' contribution is actually not for the implementation of the SADC RISDP. It's actually to pay the salary of the, 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 the SADC workers and to keep probably the, the headquarters operational. SADC RISDP programs are all donor funded, mostly all donor funded. And it has implications, of course. Uh, maybe the professor was saying, how can you, know, you expect Europe to fund your programs if you're now not consistent with their approach, maybe to regional integration? I'm just saying, don't quote me. But those are the issues. Funding is a problem. Unless we can fund our own regional integration programs, we will always depend on funding from donors, and donors are not funding because they are see, seeing a poor child on the street. They are funding within the context of their regional integration frameworks and what they want to achieve. So we, we have to, to not to, 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 to underestimate the funding, but the matter of the fact is that even when you review the RISDP, prioritize knowing that you are not funding your own integration process. Um, yes, the Zambia honey case has been um, a non-tariff barrier that has been on the NTB online system for a very long time. It's one of the long-standing and outstanding barriers that still needs to be addressed between the member states. And this is basically an SPS or sanity and phytosanitary measure which is used as a non-tariff barrier. And it can be used for, for various purposes. It might be that the private sector might be lobbying government on the one side to, to try and protect the domestic industry. Um, there are various reasons um, why this can actually be used. And also this actually shows that some of the issues like I highlighted in terms of non-tariff barriers in SADC, for instance, you know, the lack of transparency. What is the true reason behind this SPS measure being there? So if there is no notification of what the SPS measure is and what it is based on, then it's also difficult to see, but how can you now address this issue? Because the SPS measures are supposed to be based on risk assessment. It's supposed to be on sound scientific evidence. So if this is an SPS measure that doesn't have any scientific proof behind it, um, then you know, this SPS measure should have been notified somewhere 
so that the parties that is aggrieved by this measure could have seen, but this is the basis. The gentleman said that numerous studies have been done to say, but um, the, the illness that is associated with the product doesn't actually exist. Um, so then they, they should have had that information so now that they could go somewhere to try and resolve this grievance that they have. Which then also leads to another problem which um, <laughs> Professor Erasmus and William would discuss later on today is the fact of the dispute settlement. So now there is a grievance among parties regarding this SPS measure. So um, what's going to happen next? If we, it's found that it's not based on scientific evidence, where can they go now to try and resolve the issue between the member states? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joseph Msari from the Federation of Clearing and Forwarding Associations of Southern Africa. Um, very briefly, I wanted to find out the, the impact of the current tripartite uh, trade negotiations vis-a-vis -vis the RISDP. Because you find that uh, this program is completely SADAC based when at the same time we want to go into a more uh, broader integration arrangement with the EAC and COMESA. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Helen Kenani. I'm from uh, COMESA Secretariat. Um, Paul, you spoke to my heart as well. What you have experienced is what you are experiencing as COMESA as well. And it answered a lot of uh, what Professor said earlier. Sorry, I walked out and I'm not sure whether what I'm going to ask whether it had been asked earlier concerning trading services in, in SADAC. You talked about uh, the trade protocol. I was wondering whether it encompasses all the sectors. And you also talked about that the, um, the member states are supposed to improve on GATS commitments. And I wanted to know whether the negotiations have started and, and if they have started. Is that the case? Because, uh, and um, is that the case? Have they given their offers and are they WTO plus, as we would say? Because in terms of uh, commerce, we have uh, four priority sectors that we have liberalized. And what we discovered is that uh, actually some member states were even offering less than what they have offered in <laughs> under WTO. And um, member states did not reject those kind of offers and people had to go back and you know, revise. So I wanted to learn from your experience whether you have WTO plus in the offers under SADC negotiations. Um, the other thing that I wanted to add on NTBs is the fact that um, what we have discovered, um, the NTBs focal point for Comesa, and uh, we are aware of this honey, you know, protracted uh, dispute of honey and others, there are milk wars, Zambia, Kenya, there are many others. but. Uh, we have discovered that uh, the, the, some of the alleged SPS issues don't really exist. And what the real issue is, is protectionist behind the NTB. And uh, it brings him to the point of uh, domestication of what has been signed by member states and enforcement mechanism. And for that matter, COMESA member states have agreed to come up with an entire various regulations whereby now the aggrieved member state can be able through the, the council of ministers and through the heads of state and government, which is the commerce authority, invoke sanctions on the imposing member state. And we are hoping that, uh, well, it has taken like two years to be adopted. There are regulations. Once they are adopted, they become binding up upon every member state. And, um, Probably because of this sanction issue that is uh, embedded in the regulations, they have taken long to adopt it. But we, we are hoping that once it will be adopted, then we can be able to deal with this enforcement mechanism and then maybe deter these NTBs that seem to be, you know, recurrent and without, you know, with obscure reasons that, uh, you know, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Brian Moreveri. I'm a trade economist from Zimbabwe as well as a postgraduate student with the TRALAC MCOM program. I have two questions for Paul. One uh, with relates to the RSDP. Does the RSDP, having been designed in the 20th century, address issues of the 21st century with respect to global value chains, services, trade facilitation, and so on? Secondly, what will happen to existing regional economic communities when they 
the CFTA come into existence. Thank you. Paul, you mentioned very important things, particularly this uh, likely willingness to share or give up national sovereignty and policy reversals. How then do we believe these things will actually happen? We are talking about services and so on, when in fact the member states are failing to give secretariats some measure of national uh, or for supranationality. We copy from Europe what is convenient and leave out what is not convenient for us in terms of actually really saying that uh, the member state SADC or COMESA or uh, enlarged uh, tripartite free trade area can actually have some measure of sanctioning. How to sanction states that are sovereign above what they actually agree to sign in these uh, organizations. And this is happening throughout the continent, as Tandiga actually mentioned in the morning. Uh, perhaps in the, who is actually, another thing, who is actually reviewing the RISDP? Is it the Secretariat? Is it the member states? If it is independent, will Zimbabwe adhere to it? Will Zambia adhere to it? I think we've been dealing with these questions, I think, right since the 80s. And we come in, uh, I'm in group here, and go away and come in group here and talk about the same thing. Can we find out from secretaries how they can be addressed? Yes, the question was whether the SADC negotiations have started. Yes, it's been very slow. As far as I know, I think six countries have um, tabled offers. Um, unfortunately, I haven't seen them, so I wouldn't know whether they have improved on, on the GATS commitment. What I do know is that the, the, the guidelines for, for the negotiations um, state that they must improve on the existing um, GATS obligations. Then there is also a very important provision in the protocol itself, which provides that during the negotiations, member states will not adopt or imp implement measures that backslide on the existing GATS obligation. So you also have the responsibility to, to monitor your, your negotiating partners and see what they are doing in the domestic uh, uh, regulations. The priority sectors, um, they've identified six priority sectors. It's more or less the same sectors that have been um, prioritized by COMESA and the EAC. Uh, except for prof um, professional services haven't been included. The question was more on the tripartite FTA and the RISDP and linked to that is the continental FTA and what will happen to the other FTA then this fundamental problem of regional integration on policy reversals and non-compliance, which I really don't want to answer. It is a huge problem, and we had it from this morning. And that's why I think Trarak is kind enough to put it to us in, in the form of a session, I think after lunch, isn't it? Or is it tomorrow? Let's, it, it is a problem, but how do you solve it? And I always, I always compare integration with marriage. You know, you start to, to agree to marry somebody, and then you decide to be away for two weeks parting somewhere. There are consequences <laughs> to that. Maybe we must find consequences to regional integration from a, a rules-based uh, framework. And let's talk about that tomorrow. The TFTA, uh, I, I think it's important also maybe to, uh, to say that the tripartite is, is not, the TFTA is not a regional economic community at, at this stage. It's merely a tripartite free trade area 
which is complemented by other cooperation of these three RECs on infrastructure and some form of cooperation, particularly relating to trade facilitation, customs and trade facilitation. So we have to make, at this stage, we have to make a distinction between SADC and the RISDP, COMESA, EAC. You understand EAC is in already at the common market stage with the tripartite. Tripartite is an FTA. And there is no inherent contradiction between the coexistence of the tripartite FTA and this regional economic community. The contradiction will come if you create a tripartite FTA that is different from the SADAC FTA, the COMESA FTA, and you think they can coexist because you have not solved the problem of overlapping. They will still have conflicting trade regimes. They, still, they can still have different rules of origin, for instance. Then that is a problem. But in terms of the RISDP, I don't think the tripartite has really a, any adverse impact on the implementation of the RISDP. As long as the market integration component is coherent with the tripartite FTA, and it will lead to a one market integra integrated kind of regime or integrating regime. Otherwise, there is a problem. And I think we'll discuss those things tomorrow, the need to ensure coherence. But I think that understanding is very critical because I see it in most of writings. They immediately jump that continent, uh, continental FTA and tripartite FTA are similar to EAC, similar to COMESA, similar to SADAC. But it's not. It's another level of market integration, which is being targeted so that it is one. It's a common market, a, a common, uh, a single FTA for the continent, not multiple FTAs. Therefore, having multiple trade conflicting obligations. I think that is very important. That's why. At the moment, I'm not so much worried about um, the continental FTA and the, the coexistence, because the continental FTA is now supposed to, as th practically speaking, to consume the FTAs, because that is the purpose, to have a, one single trading regime. But it's not consuming SADAC. SADAC has other programs as well. The RISDP, I only talk about trade and economic liberalization. The tripartite FTA to, today, they're not talking about market integration. They're not talking about peace and security, all those issues. So I, I think we need to be very clear uh, about these distinctions at this stage. Whether now it is a stepping stone to a kind of continental economic integration in a, a broad sense, it's still to come. But at this stage, it's a market integration pillar that is trying to unify these different FTAs that exist and the problem that they pose in terms of, of overlapping constraints. I hope I have answered the question. Um, I know we haven't answered Dan's question, but Dan's question is something that I think uh, perplexes us all, and we should all be involved in thinking about. Uh, I, I find all of these things, we criticize regional organizations for not having rules-based, uh, legal-based uh, uh, systems when we, well, some of us come from countries which themselves don't have internal rules-based uh, <laughs> legal observations and so on. Uh, it's, an, it's something that I think should go through the whole conference.